Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast, where we help you master your body, mind, and the experience of life through insightful conversation, interviews with experts and thought leaders, all with a side of marital banter and some good old-fashioned humor. Yes, we are your hosts, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, and we're committed to helping you live life fully expressed physically, mentally, and experientially. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and join the conversation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast. Adam and Vanessa Lambert here with a doozy. With a super doozy. And we um, have been trying to find someone to talk about this subject for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, I really love that we're get, we're finally getting to it because yeah. today we're talking about 5G and obviously... Like you know, EMF in general. And EMF yeah. in general. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, this has been like in so many headlines and so much controversy around what is really going on with EMFs, what's really going on with 5G. And I think that... What I love about Daniel, who, who, who we're talking to today, <laughs> is that um, he comes at it from a really balanced perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, he's kind of in the camp of um, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. Let's make the best case decisions. Yes. With the information that we have now. Yeah. You know, and calling and you, you'll hear him talking about it. I mean, he's, he's really calling for more information, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what is a really sane kind of approach, and we'll, we'll talk about it in, in the podcast, but this idea that, you know, when we don't have enough information, we should err on the side of safety until mm -hmm. we do have enough information. And yes. that to me makes a lot of sense. And, you know, and, and you can say that in the way that he does without, you know, freaking out the conspiracy theorists and, you know, getting canceled for not believing that, you know, 5G is, I don't know, causing you to crash your car via the fillings in your teeth or whatever. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's, it's tough because there's a lot of material out there and what it really comes down to is that we just don't really know. We don't yeah. actually know like what these effects are. And this is, you know, with a lot of our technologies, we don't know what the long-term effects are. We don't know how it influences our physical, emotional, mental body. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things where we're kind of in this big uh, game together, this testing grounds of different things. And so, yeah, it's really tough, but you know, just to give you a little bit of background on Daniel, he was a former t telecommunications industry executive. Um, and and so I like that he comes at it from that sort of side of it mm -hmm. because, you know, he, he worked in the industry. Right. And so he's like boots on the ground, like really understands how this stuff works, how it gets rolled out, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, he is really about like, managing the exposure to EMF. Right. And, um, you know, just like you said, erring on the side of caution as much as we can. And one of the things that we have done just since this podcast, actually, is we set up a like a, a, a digital timer. A, yeah, yeah. A digital timer for our wireless network in the house. And, you know, the very interesting thing about it is that, you know, um, our little dog Penelope, she's getting up there in age she's like 16 and a half and she's been kind of suffering from a little bit of the Alzheimer's sort of the sundowner stuff. Yeah. Um, and you know, we've been going back and forth with different things and we've tried fish oil and we've done all this stuff. And when we turned off the wireless network, it, it decreased um, substantially. Yeah. Well, she her. started sleeping through the night. Yeah. She like started all, sleeping through the night. Almost instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Adam and I already keep our phones out of the room. We keep them um, away from our beds and out of the room so that, you know, there's already that distance. But just think about eliminating that network in your bedroom or throughout mm -hmm. your house in the nighttime is like, it's a no brainer. Yeah. You're yeah, not well, using it's super, it. It's super, super it's easy. I mean, it's easy. a $15 part. Yeah. You go, you plug it in, you set the timer. Ours is set to shut off at midnight. Yes. So it's off from midnight to 6 a.m., which, yeah. you know, it's only six hours. But if that six hours is affecting your sleep, yeah. you know, then you know that that just turns into everything else that's going on. So it's like, this is what I, I really love about his approach. He's like, 
why not? You yes. just don't know if right. this is a problem yet or not. There's a lot of things that point toward it being a problem. There's a lot of things that are still up in the air. But why not just take this simple step? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love that he was, you know, he did this. He came at this from just like as a father trying to protect his kids, trying yeah. to just do the right thing for his kids based on what he knows and based on, you know, just the probability of things. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's like play, play the slice with the probabilities, right. protect yourself as best you can. And, you know, again, like don't can't be super stressed about every little thing, but why not take the precautions where you can? Yeah. Simple stuff. Yeah. Like wearing a seatbelt. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like once you get used to it, you just put it on and now it's not a big deal, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And you know what would go super good with this podcast? Coffee. <laughs> A cup of your favorite Be The Wellness brew. And, you know, we've been talking more about coffee again because we're drinking it again, yeah. which is really fun. And, you know, we, it, you know, I'd, I'd done this uh, Instagram post actually the other day that was about how we really haven't been promoting it. We haven't been talking about it because we stopped drinking coffee about a year and a half ago. And it's been just out of this quarantine time, out of this time where we've just had like such good downtime, mm -hmm. such good recovery that we've been able to introduce introduce it back in and start enjoying it. And so we kind of got revitalized around the coffee. Yeah. We introduced some new um, flavors and regions, mm -hmm. which are what? Yeah. So we've brought in, so we, we, we launched the whole thing with Colombia and Peru, Yes, right? Which were two of the places that we had visited that we had the best cup of coffee, yes. right? Like twice. Yes. So this happened. We were in Colombia <laughs> and I'm like, this is the best cup of coffee I have I've ever, ever had. had. Yeah. And then it happened again in Peru mm -hmm. where, and we, we happened to find a roaster who imports directly from those regions. And right. I was able to describe what it was that we were talking about. And he's like, Oh, I know exactly what this is. It's a blah, 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 blah. And it grows in this altitude in this area. And I'm like, yes, yes. that's the stuff. <laughs> Got the samples. And I'm like, that's, that's the stuff, you know? Yeah. So we, we started with that. And then as we go different places, we like different coffee. So we introduced, um, one from Kenya, mm -hmm. which is an incredible Kenyan coffee. And anybody who's ever had it likes a light roast. That's the stuff. Yeah. And then it's amazing. Uh, it's super amazing. And it takes you, if you've ever been to Africa, I mean, that's basically what you're drinking, especially in Kenya. Like yeah. it brings you back instantly. Yeah. There's something very, very different about it. Yeah. You know, and it's, I, I really like it. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's a light roast and it's really, you know, put my coffee nerd hat on. It's fruity. <laughs> it, bright, it is fruity. It's a bright cup. Yeah, <laughs> you it know? is. And it's, it, and it's just one of those things. Like once you have a taste for it, you're like, oh man, this is really nice. And maybe it's not your everyday coffee, but it's nice to throw in there, right? Yeah. And and then also in Africa, we got a, um, a medium roast from CP Falls in Uganda. Mm -hmm. So the CP Falls region of Uganda is, um, it's kind of a special spot, right? There's the, in, I mean, not to get super nerded out on it, but there's kind of a, a very specific thing that's happening in that region from a weather perspective. And so where the coffee grows at this altitude and a certain exposure and it has just the right amount of jungle cover. So it's all shade grown. Yeah. It's really nice coffee. It's really nice. Yeah. yeah. And we had the the luxury of going to Uganda after Kenya last year or two years ago, I guess now. Mm -hmm. And again, like it just brings you back. There's something yeah. special for each one of these regions. And, you know, even if you haven't been to Uganda, like it's a way to experience flavors around the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's really and it's really different. So then the other one that we brought in is Redeemer. The Redeemer. The, the, which is from Brazil. <laughs> yes. Um, aptly named after Big Jesus. <laughs> Christ, AKA Christ the Christ Redeemer. The Redeemer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, um, and it, yeah, and that stuff is, it's really good. So it's a medium roast, but it's like, it's light and bright, kind of like the Kenyan. Yeah. And it's this, it's just a really interesting, um, blend. You know, I mean, it's not a blend, it's a single origin, but it's a, it's a interesting blend of flavors. Flavors, right. Yeah. 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 And so if all of this stuff is confusing, yeah, we also have a brand new feature on our coffee page, which is essentially a little quiz that you can take talking about the various aspects of coffee that you enjoy. And it will make suggestions about which of ours would fit your, your palate the best. Yes. So this is something we've gotten a lot of questions on. You're like, well, what's the difference between all of these things? And you're like, well, <laughs> there's a lot, you know, yeah. and so this will run you through how you like to brew your coffee, the kinds of things you put in it, all of that kind of stuff and make some recommendations. Yes. And it's spot on. Yes. Like it's, it's a good little recommendation engine. It is actually, it's amazing. I did it this morning and it picked out two of my faves, which are the Colombian and the Peruvian. So yep. it was, I was on it, you know, and I, I think that 
One other thing that's really important to mention about the coffee is that like, obviously we're, we've geeked out on this. We're coffee nerds and we really are coffee lovers, you know, in the sense that we can appreciate the flavor. But what is super cool about our coffee brand and why we started it was that these get roasted the same day and shipped to you. Right. So if you order it, it the, it's going to be roasted on the next roast day, which are Mondays or Wednesdays, and then they ship it to you that same day. Right. So it's roasted in the morning and shipped out to you. You're getting coffee that's roasted within like a day or two. Yeah, which is actually the perfect amount of time to wait after yes. the roast, right? So it's, yeah, there's it's, a whole curing thing that happens once it roasts. And yeah. Just, yeah. And just if, think about your coffees. Like, I, I don't know where you consume your coffees from, but this is one of the things that we were always trying to straddle or hurdle or whatever that word is. <laughs> some some <laughs> <Jump> gymnastics <over>. <laughs> <laughs> terminology for this. But, you know, how do you get like the real flavor, the real experience and not something that's been sitting on a shelf where arguably it's, you know, maybe getting toxins or like what whatever's going yeah. on. Who knows? But like this stuff is as good as it gets if right. you are a coffee connoisseur or lover. Yeah. yeah. And it's I think one of the biggest things is just the consistency because yes. from the day that the coffee is roasted till the day that you grind it and brew it, the, you know, over that course of time, the pr the flavor profile is going to change and all of that. And so if you, you know, if you dial in one of these coffees and you're like, this is exactly how I like it, then it's awesome because it's going to be exactly the same every mm -hmm. time. Yeah. You know, because it's going to be shipped to you. It's going to be roasted and shipped. And the amount of time it takes, you know, <laughs> to be shipped to you is going to be consistent. And so yes. it's always going to be exactly the same. And there is a feature to subscribe. So if you yeah. find your coffee you love and you want it shipped fresh to you every week, every two weeks, every month, then you can sign up for that as well. So we hope that you've enjoyed this, <laughs> this full length feature on B brand coffee, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> because no, we're really excited about it. It's fun to be drinking it again. It's fun to be enjoying it. And we hope that you guys will give it a shot as well. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. So without further ado, here is Daniel. All right. And we're live. Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Adam and Vanessa, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited about the opportunity to chat with your listening audience today. Yeah, yeah. we're really excited to have you. You know, this subject we were talking just briefly before we went live and we said, you know, this really is becoming the topic of the day. This, um, you know, radiation and 5G and just the whole, the whole Megillah. So we're really excited to hop into this. And maybe, first of all, you can just tee us off with a little bit about your background because you were kind of just talking about that. And I think it's really relevant for folks to hear your backstory before we really move into that topic of the day. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, for 30 years or so, I was in telecommunications. I actually worked on the develop and research side of telecommunications, and I ran the standards for telecom communications for digital systems. And I had technical laboratories that analyzed technology to see if there's compliance to those standards. So I'm pretty familiar for many years about these kind of technologies. Uh, and I used to, it's funny, I used to think of this stuff as a nuisance because I, I was worried about how electromagnetic radiation would influence another piece of electronics. Mm -hmm. One was generating, they call it crosstalk. And, and then all of a sudden, 10 years ago or so, I realized, wait a minute, if it's influencing electronic stuff, it's influencing our body. Mm. Uh, that actually started, that's what started me down the path of uh, just how much is it potentially bothering us. Mm. And long story short, there's such a preponderance of evidence that we now know about. Um, we know there's causal effect. Mm. Yeah. And that's something that um, I kind of want to unpack a little bit because there's there's so much evidence, you know, but there's like, there's to some degree, yeah, I, I think some people would say that there's, we're lacking a real smoking gun per se, but the, the sort of accumulation of evidence certainly points toward a need for more research or some kind of caution. And so what I'd really like to do is just try to unpack some of you know, where this discrepancy comes up and like, how come we can see what we would consider to be credible sources on both sides of the argument, you know, if it, if it is an argument, which I think it is, <laughs> um, right. like how, why are we seeing that? You know, I mean, in, in, in our world of nutrition and kind of health and wellness, I mean, there's, there's a little bit, you know, but for the most part, people can stand pretty firmly on, on some science that says, well, you know, you know, um, 
drinking gasoline is a bad idea, you know, and everybody's kind of on board with that one, you know? Right, right. But so, so what's, what's going on here? How come we have these two completely different camps? Okay. Um, first of all, you don't feel it. You don't see it. You don't smell it. You don't hear it. So w- the starting point is uh, one of doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you begin looking at the research community, particularly over the last 10, 15 years. When, when you do uh, research um, and you make a claim, the claim is based on statistics. Um, the findings you have is I am confident that the findings are correct because I have the large enough populations to make that claim. Mm-hmm. In other words, I have to, okay, here's a good example. I have to take 10,000 children, lock them into a room, radiate them for 10 years, <laughs> and then take another group of 10,000 children, radiate them, and don't radiate them, feed them healthy organic foods, right. and see the the death rate of both populations. By having over 10,000, I can statistically say at 95% confidence level that my findings are correct. So that's the basis of science. Um, And when you hear about the study works, um, they don't have 10, 15,000 participants. Right. So it's not statistically significant. Those claims can't be made. So you, you up to fairly recently, we had, I mean, literally thousands of well-documented, scientifically best practice run research that has drawn clear uh, causal effect. There is, you get exposed, this is the results, and... The problem was they didn't have 10, 15,000 um, mm. subjects. Right. Um, so when we talk about ADHD influence, or maybe we talk about is there cancer linked to it, to the frontal lobe? Uh, is is there uh, the male sperm count impacted mm-hmm. after durations of time? I can tell you clearly, for example, the male sperm, that's actually how I started doing this. My sons had the laptops on their laps, and I, my wife says she wants grandchildren. And I said, <laughs> the, but the power levels are not enough, I said to her. But what I did was I looked at some of the research, and I was like surprised. After about three or four hours, uh, t- about 20, 25% of the male sperm becomes immobile, mm-hmm. a- and the quality of the sperm is reduced. And by the way, it's the same thing for a female. Uh, there, there is tumors after long durations of use that are created in the groin areas of a female. And of that, uh, they're non, typically non-tumorous, uh, but a very small portion of that becomes cancerous. So mm-hmm. that's not statistically significant, but that was a research study that occurred. Right. So, so you really can't look at um, uh, this... Um, uh, w- w- if you're going to make a claim without having good statistics. Given I said that, there's repetition in research. So you go above the research study itself and you look at the metadata. Mm-hmm. And and you look across the metadata, now it starts becoming more statistically significant. And there's been rapidity uh, in the results being found um, which is not, you can't claim a 95% confidence level, but you can say, my goodness, look at all the commonality we found. It's, right. it's overwhelming. Mm. Recently, over the last few years, that has changed a bit. The, the National Toxicity Program, which is a, a division of the federal government, spent probably $25, $30 million over a 10-year period, and they had an epidemiology study where there were tens of thousands of rats and mice that were used. Mm-hmm. And they found, after the study, of exposures to cell phones, their current transmit cell phone radiations, direct links to frontal lobe and heart cancer. Mm-hmm. So it was statistically significant. 
um, that to me was a sort of a, a sort of an important result because we know we're not going to take ten thousand kids and right, try right. to find the same result. So, and and, in, and as you may know, in epidemiology, it's almost always the indicator of where we should look next because there's so much similarities that we can make claims that do correlate. So independently of the National Toxicity Program, the Ramazani Institute out of Italy, um, they're a consortium of uh, researchers, and they ran an epidemiology study just like the NTP. They found that it was, they had statistically significant data that found virtually the same results. Frontal lobe cancer and um, statistically significant increase in heart cancer. Right. So, and this was kind of a dose, uh, there was a dose response curve, right? So I mean, yeah, it was, right, exactly. it followed, yeah, like everything you would look for in, hey, this seems to be the deal. Right. And, and, and by the way, the, 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 uh, experts, the, the medical community that created the, um, the NTP, uh, uh, study, they were pretty smart people because if you look at the standards for cell phone protection that the FCC developed, uh, in 86, um, it was based on the thermal impact. Mm. Uh, ther- thermal means heating up the skin when contact is made with an RF signal. And the standard says it can't increase by two degrees. So, um, and oh, by the way, they never worried about the biological in the standard, only the thermal. Right. Th- th- thermal, by the way, uh, I'm going to side go side side on on you a bit. Uh, A a microwave oven is 2.3 gigahertz. A a Wi-Fi transmitter is 2.4 gigahertz. That's, they're very, very close. The power level of a Wi-Fi is much lower than a microwave. But when you turn on your microwave, the water in between the cells heat up Mm -hmm. and it oscillates the cells and voila, your meat's cooked. Well, that's what we mean by thermal. RF signals, the radio frequency stuff we talk about today, it's a microwave. It's considered microwave. It is a, 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 uh, RF and microwave are synonymous. Mm-hmm. So when they ran the studies, they took those transmitters far enough away from the subject matter of subjects that they eliminated the potential for the uh, thermal impact. And what they now see is the biological, which, uh, long story short, that's a lot of the discussion today. What is the biological impacts? Right, right. Yeah, because I think, and that's something that, you know, when you when you read or, or listen to people who talk about this not being potentially an issue, they're like, oh, well, you know, you get radiation all of the time in the form of a sunburn. Like, this is what happens when, the you know... Um, when the radiation is strong enough to get this to get this effect, this is what's happening. It's literally heating you. But there's this whole other aspect yeah. of it. Well, and you know, to be fair, now there's people that are spending thousands of dollars on infrared saunas to do exactly this, right? <laughs> <laughs> to get this right, thermal like, radiation. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but there's you know, but there's this whole other aspect of it that is, you know. Uh, that it, you're you're right. Well, it's really what we're talking about today. Like what? Okay, so what's happening at a cellular level that could be potentially, you know, I mean, there's just such a, a rabbit hole here with the calcium channel uh, stuff and and this whole deal. But like, do we really know what's going on, or are we kind of still looking at it from this perspective of like, man, it's something is happening, and we do see these results kind of in the meta analysis and certainly in the animal models. And like this is enough to, to to sort of garner some sort of caution. Is that kind of what okay? I'm so, Adam, uh, very good question, and I'm going to break it down into two ways. I'm going to talk about what it does to the cell, and I'm going to separate that from what it does to the body systems. Hmm. You know, what is the neurological impact versus what is the cell impact? There are two separate sort of discussions. The calcium channel stuff, for example, your cell sits there and gets bombarded by electromagnetic radiation. What's happening with the membrane is that it's getting irritated by the electrical and 
and the um, magnetic forces on the surface. When, when that gets excessive, the, the channel that your own calcium penetrates that cell. Oxide builds up, nitrogen oxide builds up within the cell. Chemical reactions occur, and it mutates or DNA damages the cell. So that's a breakdown that we know about. We, we uh, Dr. Powell um, out of uh, Portland has has done extraordinary work on really helping us define what that breakdown looks like and what's the mechanics associated with it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not worried about that so much as I am. W- there are 4,000 human system processes in the body or more. Mm. And you can't sleep at night because a cell phone is near your head and your melatonin process, the, what, what the machine t- is is interfered with and you don't necessarily get the melatonin you're looking for. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But right. it is really more the depression, anxiety we talk about these days, the headaches we, we take. The memory concentration issues we may have, all related to the impact of electromagnetic radiation outside of the breakdown of the cell. Mm. Hmm. Got it. Because, and that's, I think that's an interesting point that you make because that was sort of, you know, and I'm not a biologist, you know, but I, 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 I can read research to some degree, you know, and I, so yeah, I read through yeah. some of that stuff of, of Dr. Paul, Powell or Paul. And this voltage, you know, the voltage gated calcium yeah. channels, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and th- so these are natural processes within the body that, that, you know, the, the external voltage that we're being exposed to is triggering. And so like, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, okay, well, that's probably not great, but our body does have a way of mitigating excess calcium inside the cell, right? Like this is something that, that happens and our body can probably balance it. But what you're talking about when it comes to, all of these other sort of less tangible things, it's just, it's like, it seems like a, it's just a whole box of worms, you know, or a whole can of worms that I'm, I'm curious, like, how do we, how do we start to, to unpack this for, as far as like what to do about it, you know? Um, Adam, 15 years ago, I had a cell phone. I would try to call my friends, but they didn't have a cell phone. So I didn't use it very much. And there were very few cell phones around. Fast forward today, your child at six years old walking around with a cell phone, using it hours at a time. Right. So the sense of urgency only became only a few years ago when it started becoming so pervasive. Mm. And um, and that's why we really should be thinking about the environmental toxin, this new environmental toxin that didn't exist before. I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the 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 uh, cell phone is one point six watts per kilogram. They can't can't exceed one point six watts per kilogram, and 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 so it can't heat up your skin by two degrees, and it can't penetrate your brain or into the skull by one to two inches. That was the standard. The standard was created, I don't know, in 86 or so, and it was based on the army six-foot male. Mm. And they modeled this six-foot male, and they said, those characteristics of that male, that, that model, is what we're going to design the standard for. Well, Vanessa, as you know, it represents three percent of the population, <laughs> <laughs> right? How about well, probably women? less. But the every women, day. what happened to kids? <laughs> you yeah, know, totally. Like, give me a break. Um, and, and so, when we talk about the standards, uh, we, we talk about it b- b- fairly uh, antiquated in a sense because it really didn't characterize the full impact. And it was at a time where casual use was 15 minutes a day. You, you use a phone 15 minutes an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so like all of a sudden, the 
and and you have your laptop, Wi-Fi, and you know your laptop, your tablet, and your cell phone right next to you on the bedside, mm. all producing transmitters that have radio frequency potentially interfering with your own body. Mm. So. Let's, um, I'm, I'm curious cause we're kind of talking about broad strokes here with, you know, sort of the impact of devices and radiation, but can you kind of cue up for us the, the current issue right now with 5g sort of becoming the next standard and this transition from the current technology into 5g and, and what, you know, the concerns are about and kind of, you know, your opinion and, and sort of the anecdotal evidence that we have and, and also some of the arguments there sort of against, you know, the fears or the worries about that being a, a problem um, in terms of the rollout. No, no, no problem, Vanessa. Let, let me start by talking what is up to 4G. And then we're going to talk about what 5G is. Okay. Uh, up to 4G, you have a power level of 1.6 watts per kilogram. We just said that. And it is at a frequency rate, a frequency. What is a frequency? Um, a hertz. Mm -hmm. That's a standard in the industry. And a hertz is one cycle per second. Think of it as a wave on an ocean and you see one wave, and one second later, you see another wave. One cycle per second. That's a hertz. A cell phone uses 900, roughly 900 to two, 900 megahertz to two, to roughly one to two gigahertz. A megahertz is a million cycles per second. Every second, one million of those waves pass by. Um, and so all of a sudden we have waves going much, much faster than a hertz, obviously. And, and then we have, in addition to that, we have a pulsing signal. Um, a, a, the pulsing signal is on off. It's a, it's a digital signal. On off, on off, on off. If I took a, 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 a steel rod and I put a 10,000 pound elephant on top, of the steel rod, and I had a piece of concrete below it, and it just sat there, the concrete wouldn't break. If I had the elephant jump up and down on the rod, the, uh, it would immediately break. So it's a jackhammer, in a sense. To, and that analogy is what's happening with the cell. It's a jackhammer to the cell because it's a pulsing signal. We know from research that if you vary the the way in which you create the signal, it will vary the results of the impact of the cell. And so our current digital signals, we know, create a problem. Uh, 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 up to all the uh, symptoms we just spoke about, all of these things have been created up to 4G. And, and by the way, with up to 4G, a, a cell phone or any other RF signal impedes your immune system. Believe it or not, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ali Johansson, um, a couple of years ago, actually shows the mechanics of how it impedes immune. Um, so you're starting off sort of, you know, impeded a little bit because if you're exposed to that or other weaknesses, you're actually weakened yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so w why is all that important? Because now we're moving to 5G. And this part's sort of pretty important to understand. Most everything in 5G that you've heard about and that's been deployed is what is called 6 gigahertz, sub-6 gigahertz. In other words, it's all below 6 gigahertz. It's all below 6 billion cycles per second. Mm -hmm. It's stuff that's been around for a long, long time, right? It's just that the FCC just allowed us to use the telecommunications pathway at those frequency rates. Right. Uh, so, so things like radar yeah, like fall into that, right? Is that AM, right? AM yeah. radio, FM radio, okay. Wi-Fi was always mm -hmm. not used for telecommunications. So it's been around a long time. What's different now is when you hear about 5G deployed, 
there's 4G and less right next to it. So you're adding more uh, electro, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're adding more radio frequency signals into the environment. It's like but, you're stacking them almost. Yeah, right, right. It, it's mm-hmm. accumulative. It, mm-hmm. It's a, it's increasing the ambient, the air around us, the, the space around us is now increasing. And um, that in and of itself can exaggerate the eye strain, the, the burning sensations, the body aches, the depression, um, the physiological, neurological impacts. So th- those things, as I mentioned before, they all suppress immune. In other words, your gut is impacted. Mm-hmm. Um, and so why is that important? As, as you guys know, um, um, there are 10 times more bugs in your gut than there are cells in your body. It, it's so important to maintain a healthy uh, gut. Uh, uh, and, and when it's been suppressed in any way, um, that's not a good thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that important to know? Because when you go above that to the other part of 5G, which a lot of people talk about is the, maybe a, an issue, is all the stuff above six sub gigahertz. It's above it. It's between 20 and 60, maybe 70 gigahertz. It's, it's going really, really fast. You know, remember, 20 billion cycles per second. So now it's almost orders of magnitude faster. But because of that, it can't go very far. When, when, when a wave is really, really long, it goes really, really far. When it's really, really short, it goes really, really short. <laughs> mm-hmm. It doesn't go very far. So what you're hearing about 5G is all about the millimeter mm. so, small cell site transmission, the stuff that's in front of your house, that when it's transmitting at 20 to 60 gigahertz is transmitting and can only go 750 feet. Right. Hmm. And because it can go only short, they have to do other things to the transmission to make sure it gets there. So they increase the amplitude of the power levels from the transmitters. So your hmm. the small cell site is where... Uh, a cell tower can transmit five, six miles. This can only go 700 feet. And the cell tower uses 60 watts. This is 20 watts. So it's a third, but it can only go 750 feet. So the power levels are higher than we've seen in our environment before. And another way they try to make sure you get the signal is by sending two to the same source, multi, multi uh, MIMO, they call it, multi in, multi out. So now you have two pulsing signals towards your cell phone, basically towards your head. Um, and now you have two elephants going right. up and down, up and down, right? <laughs> so what's the impact of that? I don't know. None of us know because we really have no study work whatsoever in the laboratories that talk about those dangers. But to make claims today that we see the physical impairment that's extreme um, just doesn't hold water at all. Mm-hmm. If if you told me that you found leukemia in your area, well, 600 megahertz is used at high levels. We know it creates leukemia. Mm-hmm. So uh, so if you said, hey, look at this leukemia, uh, and I'd look and say, there's the transmitters. Yeah, it's definitely correlated. We know from study work that that's true. But there's none of that. What I can say is with the sub-6 gigahertz stuff, you are going to feel da- fatigued. You, you, you will feel nauseous, maybe even a little bit more mm. um, because of those. When we have the sub uh, above sub-6, you're going to have... Um, cell, uh, c- st- 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 your gut, uh, the, the biome of your gut loves uh, f- uh, four, 4G signals. It mm-hmm. propagates the good and the bad. So that potentially disrupts, weakens your immune, 
And that's some of the stuff that may be underlying some of the symptoms you're feeling. Yeah. And, and, and that we know uh, is true uh, on many of these things. Yeah. So let me just hover on that for a second, because I haven't heard this specifically about the gut. So what, is, what do you mean when you say that your gut loves the, the, the 4G? Is there... Bacteria and so, virus. Right. The bacteria and virus actually propagate uh, more aggressively um, in the presence of electromagnetic radiation. Of, of specifically that type of yeah. the, the 4G. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, it already does it. Um, and if you were to go to a clinic that specializes in electromagnetic radiation, they actually go after the gut, looking for leaky gut, looking mm. for blood brain barriers down. They look for all those kinds of things that you'd, you'd, you'd look for. Um, and, and so that we know is true. The reason yeah, I tell you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Adam. I was going to say this. The, the reason some of the stuff is just so fascinating is that, you know, on the one hand, we have this, you know, potentially like hormetic positive effect of some of this stuff. Right. I mean, there's PEMF treatments, you know, for, yeah, for right. things like this. And then on the other side of it, there's this this potential, you know, for downside. I mean, I oh, guess yeah. it's just the, the the dose makes the poison. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so um, because the power level is going to be higher in the small cell site towers. We all we know, for example, that I saw some research on um, twenty gigahertz, and guess what? Bugs loved it, mm. and so they propagated more aggressively than they would normally in the presence of twenty gigahertz. Um, and so it's more the same thing. Um, it, it didn't create a different mechanic within the body to create different things in the body that don't exist today. It's just hitting the same stuff it always has and maybe even making it worse potentially. We don't know. A, a little bit of an amplification. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering, you know, cause the, I, it's something you said earlier too, which Vanessa commented on, which is sort of this stacking, right? This just this, yeah. this overall increase in our exposure to, um, to EMF and like we're, we're running out of places to be, um, away from it, right. To like give our body. I mean, if there's, if there's anything we know about how the body gets stronger, it's by exposing it to a stressor and then taking the stressor away and letting it recover. Right. Right. And right. So, so some of what I'm hearing here is that it's this cumulative sort of constant exposure that poses the biggest kind of risks. Yep. Um, and even, even though we can't quite put our fingers on them yet, it seems, I don't know. It seems true. <laughs> well, it, it's a really good question. So do you think, Dan, in your opinion, is there, I mean, Adam's bringing up this like hormetic stress idea. Is there any amount of this that, you know, is okay, is, is, you know, good for the body? I know that's probably a stretch, but I mean, d is there anything in your um, experience that says, actually, you know, it's really fine for us to get this level of exposure. And in fact, our bodies over time have trended to adapt or or perform under this kind of stress is there anything like that or or is it really just you know we don't know and the more we increase it without before we really know the larger of a question mark we have on this whole thing v Vanessa absolutely true um, the reason I told you the story about why now mm -hmm. is because humans up to 15 years ago, weren't exposed to radio frequency signals so much. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's actually the the last hundred years where radio was invented, um, and um, we started transmitting at sixty megahertz, and and so we it's been around, but never so close. Mm -hmm. It's never been so close to us. I'll give you an example in a classroom where kids are using their laptops in the classroom with Wi-Fi transmitters. I talked about a cell phone transmitting 1.6 watts per kilogram, or 1.6 watts. Um, when you are in a classroom that's full of Wi-Fi, you're talking about dot five watts, about a third, mm. constantly for seven hours mm. a day. 20 years ago, that never existed. So the kid's body, if it was a really, really, really powerful signal, the body would say, stop. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's sneaking in a bit. 
And because it's sneaking in, we really don't know the full effects. Although we do know that kids are more challenging than ever in a classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and which is just like what I'm I'm looking at this is almost like a total when you're just tallying the environmental stress of being human these days, there's just it's coming at us from so many angles. It's in oh, our yeah. food systems, it's our water, it's now it's in the air. I mean, it's just like whether or not we can pull any one thing out as the the real culprit, it's just like this like I said this the stacking of it all and it's no wonder that kids are struggling. Yeah, oh, exactly. And, and, and let, let's take that a little bit for, farther. Um, it is an environmental toxin to the body. Mm-hmm. Mm. It is as toxic as the fumes from a welder that's spewing out. It's the volatile organic compounds that are spewing out of a 55-gallon drum in a room. All the Wi-Fi the the gas the welder they're all to be carcinogenics mm-hmm. we we know who sees this as a carcinogenic the cell doesn't know the difference we any of those the cell doesn't invent a different way to respond to these kinds of things so what we're seeing is typical response to toxins in the environment that have always been true um and so there is definitely a response by the cell they call it cell danger response where th- there's a melabo- metabolic response to a a irritant to the body, I could be hitting you with a hammer and your ir- your cells are irritated, right. or I could be hitting you with the electromagnetic radiation. It's irritated. When it gets into that state, it's a flight state. It's like if you walk into a room and it's uh, ten below zero, you lose the the um, blood flow in your hands and feet. So you protect your inside organs. Well, that's what's happening here. Your body responds in a general way. It has a cell danger response, they call it. And it is now adjusting how you normally live. And if you get into that state, it may get worse in time. Mm -hmm. So it is getting more and more important. And we're now beginning to understand a little bit about um, what that means. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, that's that's stress. Any stress can create oxidative stress. This is one only a stressor. But I hate to talk about oxidative stress because it's oxidative stress definition is uh, the imbalance of radical free radicals to antioxidants, right? And and but that doesn't define the CDR response. It's far more complex than that. Um, and and it certainly doesn't address what happens to the system response. And I'll give you an example. We, we've talked about um, melatonin, mm-hmm. I think. And when you look at um, a screen on, on, your, uh, uh, on a monitor, um, there is high intensity LEDs and there is a blue component of that spectrum. As I mentioned before, visible light is the light you see it, and it's electromagnetic radiation. So when, when you're looking at the blue light coming off of a screen, it's entering into the eye. So I, I can tell you about things like you can have pre- premature macular degeneration. You can have dry eye. There are a lot of studies that we know directly link that causal effect. Mm-hmm. But the other stuff you typically don't hear about is there's a cryptochrome protein behind the eye. It's the on-off switch to melatonin. So mm-hmm. when, you, when so when you're sitting reading your uh, iPad, Vanessa, at eleven o'clock just before you go to bed and all of a sudden you can't sleep, is because the melatonin switch didn't turn on. Mm -hmm. So there is an influence directly through the eye uh, to the controlling functions of the body through the brain. And and then you have the interference of the RF signals through your ear pathway, which is now also affecting 
the the creation of melatonin. That's yeah. why at the end of the day, you don't want none of, the, none of these things in your bedroom. And we'll talk yeah. a little bit about that later. Yeah, it seems like that is just kind of the number one deal. I mean, we're we're so protective of our sleep. It's like, you know, number no, the it all starts with sleep. Is kind of like what we <laughs> like to say. You know, it's like if you want to get better at anything, improve your sleep. And, oh, yeah. you know, and so we we know this. You know, the the, the blue light um, connection to melatonin production is you know, is something that we've been talking about for a while. But I, you know, in reading your book, there was a part in there that mentioned that these RF frequencies are potentially impacting the pineal gland. And oh, yeah. which, which yeah. is super interesting as oh, a, yeah. you, because that, that weird little acorn in the middle of our brain does so many things. <laughs> oh my, my goodness. I, actually think of the eye as the pathway to the brain through the pineal gland, right? If you think of it that way, your balance is being controlled. Your hearing is being controlled. All sorts of stuff is being controlled by the pineal gland. And if there's a mixture of conditions, for example, uh, if you um, have uh, a high concentration of uh, uh, fluoride in the pineal gland and you have a, 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 a gene, a specific kind of gene, which many people have, and you have Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz, that combination makes you three times more likely to get cancer of the pineal gland. Hmm. Hmm. So that was something that came out of Yale um, last year, I think. So we know that um, it's sort of important. We didn't know how much of important it really is. Uh, and we're learning more and more that it is really, really more than more important than just dry eye. Right. Yeah, I it's kind a, of far. far I, had, I had a doctor, a, a, a clinician that I work with, and he was telling me about someone in his clinic that had dry eye for the last five years. And I said, "What's her source?" And he said, "I don't know, but I, you know, give her the drops, and she's really fine." I so I sent her a pair of uh, blue block, blocking light. The glasses within two hours, within two hours, the redness of the eye disappeared and the dryness became wet. So mm. it really does make a difference to some. For many of us, it may not, but there is sort of on the edge of this a, a percentage of our population that is more susceptible than us. And, and, and I actually talk about that in the book, Electromagnetic Hypersensitivity. Um, yeah. what, what we know is that roughly 20% or more of the population in general is electric hypersensitive. In other words, if they walk near a router, they can feel it. They get headaches. They get anxious. Um, and of that, by the way, 80% of women. Mm. Hmm. Like, how's that? We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, give me, a, you know, why is that? And and we really don't know, although we we, we postulate that. It's the mineral um, deficiencies, potentially. It, it's the mineral uh, concentrations. It, th there's a lot of discussion about w really why is that true, but no one really knows. So in other words, women be more careful than men to mm -hmm. these exposures. Right. So something that you just brought up that I think is interesting is the is the mineral concentration, right? Because And this is something that we, um, you know, we focus on a little because we have people in our community who – you know, eat a super low carbohydrate or maybe ketogenic diet, in which case they don't retain as much sodium, right? And so there's, you know, we're, we're like actively trying to increase the electrolytes. And we know that a big part of kind of what goes on with energy production in that realm is that without the proper, the appropriate electrolytes, our, our cellular fluids are just not quite as conductive, right? Right. And exactly. so, by the so way, the sodium just, is really important too, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it's, you know, sodium gets a bad rap, I think, in, yeah, yeah, in, a, lot of, in yeah. a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, so so I'm assuming that just based on that, this is the first time I really thought about this, but like that, you know, um, kind of un maybe unfortunately, like the people who have the the kind of most conductive um, mixture in their in their fluids, right? If they're the people with the most conductive balance of electrolytes may actually be more susceptible to 
EMF, or am I thinking about that wrong? No, actually, what you're referring to is conductivity of the body itself, right? What's mm, the conductivity? Yeah. When when you look at a, um, a a brain, for example, and you're looking for dysfunction within the brain, you look for the resistive path of the from point to point within uh, the, the 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 testing, and mm-hmm. and you you can tell by the millivolts milli- milli- just how it's performing just how conductive it really is and where it needs to be. So um, there's no doubt that hydration, um, um, balanced, clean food sources, your circadian rhythm, your sleep cycle, and and that's because you want to make sure you're recovering from the day. And we know that um, electromagnetic radiation influences the uh, the uh, the uh, base of the spine, which is part of how you recover at night with your your mel- uh, mitochondrial uh, uh, cells, that's how they recover. And if it's impeded, then you have to work on how to improve those kinds of things to get a a person to recover from where they are if they're electric hypersensitive. I, I've actually I've actually seen uh, be, because it's beginning to accelerate in our in our community. We've seen more and more clinics seeing more and more of the symptoms that are correlatable to their environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's electromagnetic radiation that's becoming a trigger to the extent where one, one story, uh, actually, we just posted it. Um, he was uh, an electrician in a very high concentrated um, uh, environment of electric uh, ma- magnetic radiation. And he actually couldn't walk. Guess what? That was the pineal gland, right? He mm-hmm. he couldn't find his balance. He he was he was walking, and his brain waves were sleeping. Hmm. He was hmm. sleeping, and his brain waves were walking. In other words, <laughs> alpha beta was not in sync with his body. Um, and so we know that the electromagnetic radiation is changing. The, what I refer to as the supervisory function of the body, which is within the brain. So um, w- that kind of patient is being seen more and more. And in this case, he actually came in a wheelchair into one clinic, and it took about nine months to get him walking and being more normal. And they believe it was electromagnetic radiation exposures in his job. Yeah, mm. that, that's what really is coming through for me or what occurs to me in talking about this is that, you know, in our field, we see a lot of people with autoimmune disorders, but we also see a lot of people who have a really difficult time find, finding a diagnosis yes. for what ails them. Yes. And what's coming through to me is that like there's just this is part of the conundrum we find ourselves in yes. is that there's no measurable way to know how this might influence anyone's body. Yeah. By the way, a biomarker, you're likely 100% of the time to have excess zinc. I have no idea why, but it's true. It's actually the uh, it's the uh, uh, copper uh, zinc ratio that's the problem. But um, but there are actually we're learning what some of these biomarkers actually are. Mm-hmm. Um. And, and that, that's cool. specific to folks with the hypersensitivity. Yeah, right. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but again, I actually think of them as the canaries in the coal mine. It's actually right. influencing all of us. Somehow it's less influential with me than maybe someone else. Um, mm-hmm. right. But remember, you know, two out of 10 of us are walking around with problems from the directly in the environment they live in. Right. Yeah, one one way yeah. or the other. <laughs> it, well, so it, I'm just like I'm picturing, you know, the telecommunications companies and the people that are so anxious to roll out 5G. And I just, I guess, what I don't understand is like, like, is this just not important enough? Do people just not get that this is important enough to just slow the rollout of this enough till we really have an understanding? Or do you think that the push to really get it out there so quickly is because inevitably people will understand that we probably shouldn't roll it out, that it probably does have too great of an effect for the benefit that it brings society? 
One of the things I would suggest is don't put too much in the brilliance of the telecom network uh, mm -hmm. leaders. <laughs> yeah, totally. They, they, what, they're, what they want to do is make sure that they stay in business and they want to make sure they continue providing networks that meet the demand of the customer. Mm -hmm. And so there was 1G, then there was 2G, then there was 3G. Every one of them changing the network infrastructure essentially to be able to provide new and additional services. When self, you know, I, I want a, a phone that I answer and talk to someone. I don't want a phone that, that I tweet about stuff, right. you know, <laughs> uh, right. but yet we now tweet, uh, we do so many things from our cell phone. Um, and so that is an evolution of demand that's being met by these industries and it's competitive. So they're trying to find ways of bringing services that can evolve to meet the needs cost effectively. Mm -hmm. So if I was a leader of, of a telecom and I wanted to put the cable companies out of business, I would, I would put 5g in a network mm -hmm. because now I could eliminate the cable, the coaxial cable to the home. Mm -hmm. right. And now I have the bandwidth to provide the TV you want to watch. And that, I mean, that's really what it comes down to essentially, yeah, right? Yeah, that this yeah. is what There's they're trying to compete yeah. with is like real hardwired networks that are, you know, have been right. laid over the world. <laughs> yeah. And, and we can yeah. lay claim, but the FCC, there's not one medical expert. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. When I worked in Bell Labs, not one medical expert. <laughs> it wasn't like the, the things we thought about. And um, now we're talking about like technologies. Um, yeah. So there was a lonely um, biochemist 30, 40 years ago that said, you're not dying from the, uh, the eggs you're eating. It's the trans fat you're cooking with. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so it took 40 years before it was banned. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't really know the 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 the, the person who invented X rays. Um, his his associate was uh, X rayed all the time to show how wonderful it was. He died of uh, he he died of uh, radiation cancer. Right. You, you know, so it's the it's being created, but we we, we as a society learn uh, maybe sometimes a little bit too late what the impact is, and I think some of that is going on here. Um, right. It's sort of unfortunate that this seems to be so aggressively different and so poorly understood and so aggressively being deployed. And um, for that, I think it's inappropriate. But um, I think if we slowed it down a little bit, we could learn more and better understand how we best serve the, the uh, customer base with um, the right technology that doesn't create more problems than it solves. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think that there's something really important about that because we, there, there's a tendency and I mean, I, in my lifetime, I've, I feel like this tendency is increasing and that is to sort of, you know, give up your individual responsibility and hand it over to regulators, right. To say, Hey man, I just want the fastest TV and internet and everything that I can have. And I expect that the regulators are going to make sure that I'm safe in doing so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's literally what happens. It's, it's a very tight knit community, right? The, right. The, 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 the head of the FCC that approved 5G happened to be the ch president and chairman of CTIA, a wireless cell consortium. And and so it was like the chicken, uh, the fox went into the chicken, uh, into right. the chicken uh, the hen house. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, so but but and, and on on the other hand, you couldn't take someone who doesn't understand the problems to, to mm -hmm. ev evaluate the technologies. So right. it, it's the, they do it in chemicals, they do it in pharmaceuticals. They this is all the kind of modern infrastructure we have kind of approach to things. It's unfortunate in this case, it's true. It may be, I am, I would say that we should think about how we modify our behavior, our lifestyles. So we minimize those exposures. And that's what we're really right. here to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah. And so that actually 
keys up something that um, I, there's just this little passage in your book that I think is, it, it really just sums this stuff up, you know, and I, and I do, I like the, I like the approach that you took with the book because you're really just trying to prevent, present the information and encourage people to figure it out for themselves, which I, yep. I really appreciate, you know, especially coming from somebody who actually sells products that solve these problems, you know, so it's really <laughs> nice to see this, like, hey, look, this is what we've come to, you know, but you're talking here about the precautionary principle and the definition according to UNESCO is when human activities may lead to morally unacceptable harm that is scientifically plausible, but uncertain actions shall be taken to avoid or diminish that harm. And I just think that that really, like, I don't know that you could put a better bow on this whole thing. It's like, man, we don't know. There's a, so there's a lot of evidence that points towards this stuff being weird and why risk it, you know, and, right, and the, exactly. the, the, the cigarette, you know, company or the tobacco company analogy falls pretty closely with this, right? We're like, oh yeah, there was all sorts of studies that said, no, yeah. man, there is nothing wrong with smoking cigarettes, <laughs> you know, Adam, and uh, here we are now. You know, uh, um, many, many years ago when I was 12, and I'm not going to tell you how many years that is, <laughs> <laughs> I smoked cigarettes. Uh, you know, I, I was a big man. Uh, th- they had commercials that uh, suggested, you know, you, you, you're really a cool person if you smoke cigarettes. At that time, science knew there was a direct correlated link between smoking cigarettes and cancer in the lungs. Right. But we didn't know about it. The mentality at that time was um, very different than it is today. Uh, in fact, in, I, I remember like 78, 79, there was the head of Mar- Philip Morris was front, uh, in front of pediatricians in, in, um, in the UK. And the, they asked, um, is it bad for a woman to smoke cigarettes when she's pregnant? And he said, absolutely not. And then he thought about it a little bit and he said, wait a minute, the babies are smaller. So what woman wouldn't want a smaller baby? <laughs> that was the mentality at the I've time. I've seen this. I've yeah. seen this. It's yeah. so bizarre. Mm-hmm. It's bizarre. That, that, that mm-hmm. was, and that's a little bit about what's going on here. Um, yeah. But what are you going to do? I, 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 I love that you make that comparison because I think that like what's really happening is that there's probably a deep seated knowing that this isn't the greatest for society, but people cling to small anecdotal or small pieces of, of evidence or story that make it okay. And I think what you're talking about the telecommunications companies is that they're probably just cherry picking little bits of information that makes it okay for them to continue down this path yeah. without really knowing. And yeah. I think that that's just like, yeah. that's actually speaks to the larger problems that we have in this society is that there's this sense of like, oh, well, I'm looking at enough studies or I'm looking at enough data to support the trajectory I'm on. But really, I'm only looking at the things that support my trajectory because right. this is how I make my money and this is where, right. you know, this is my my life's work or whatever you want to say. And it's just like, this is just the bigger problem of society is how do we Absolutely. pull back the layers of our commitment to, you know, society over our jobs, over, you know, technology, over all of these things that have become so much more important than life itself right. almost. Well, and yeah. just even hell and headlines, right? And it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and an interesting, and like this is actually a perfect example of this. So you had mentioned before the IARC Group 2B, right? Which is this yes. classification right, of right. things that are, hey, this might be, you know, possibly carcinogenic, right? And you were talking about the fumes and, you know, in the book, you talk about DDT and glyphosate and things right. that we all are like, these things, these things are like clearly toxic. You know, right, I mean, we right. would all just think of it that way that fall in that category. But then on the flip side, also in that category are things like echinacea and aloe vera and yep. fermented vegetables, Asian style, which I'm assuming is like kimchi, right? Right. So it's right. like you have this, there's these two completely opposite sides right. of it that if, if like what Vanessa is saying, you're just out looking for the data that supports your worldview, it's there. You yeah. know what I mean? You can find it, you know? <laughs> but by the way, with the who, uh, the, the draft said it was a carcinogenic and mm. then the politics changed it to a possible carcinogenic. Um, and that mm-hmm. was before the NTP and Ramazani Institute. Right. Now, with right. those statistically significant studies, members of that WHO organization have already stated they would change the classification to 2A. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So, um, and is that so? How does that even work? Like, when do can you like? Do they just they're like, well, in in twenty years when we re-update this list, we're going to change it, or is it something right. that has to be it's, petitioned? It, like, it, how does it, it go? It it it's a periodic um, meet of experts, mm. and they really are experts. Um, and they do look at the data and I'm not sure their choice was wrong with the current data. And there was no statistical significance in what they saw. And I, I actually think they may have done the right thing. Um, but they don't meet every month. They meet right. every 10 <laughs> years. So right. we're, we're sort of stuck with the, uh, classification and we know from the research that obviously it's wrong today. Now we have the new information, but you're right. Look, we're not going to change what's happening in the uh, in the public domain. Cigarette smoking stopped not because we knew the study work. What well, stopped because it went to court and lost. Mm. It was the court that made it common knowledge. It was not the industry or or the researchers. It was the courts, and you have those kind of events that make a change to some of the things that are occurring, like it did with the uh, uh, trans fats, like it did with the cigarettes, and like I believe we'll do here. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was, uh, we, during quarantine or during this shelter in place episode, Adam and I have been up at my mom's house, which is in Northern California, in the country. They don't have 5G. They don't, I mean, everything is sort of um, you know, away from the more, it's uh, the eighties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a little, it's less developed. Right. Yeah. But one of the first things that I noticed after staying here for a couple of weeks was how much calmer I felt. And, you know, we've been living in LA for the last 10 years and I was just really, really keenly aware to how different my own energy was and yeah. also keenly aware of how much easier it is for me to meditate. Yep. In, in the morning, I just would like be able to drop in so much easier. And I really did cue me up to this idea that, you know, living in LA, there's just so much in the environment. There's so much oh, going there, on. There's no question about it, Vanessa. No, no question about it. And the thing about it is, is that like, I had to really be in an awareness of myself to to pull that out, right? I wasn't sick. There wasn't something crazy happening that, you know, really pointed out to me that something was wrong. It was really the disparity of kind of like having that exposure and not and me going, huh, what's different about this? And so I think the thing for me that's really resonating is that, you know, people might not even be correlating the things that are Yep. The, how they're being affected by this. Mm -hmm. And it could be as simple as you're ju you just have a little bit more chaos in your mind or you just can't stay calm as much. And like, even if it's just that, even if that's like the only effect you're having, is that something that we want to systematically encourage and go down that rabbit hole even deeper and more with deeper commitment? And, right. and that's what's just really there for me is like, I mean, anything that takes me further away from myself, I'm not really that interested yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, Th think of it. Think of it this way, Vanessa. If you have a, a a router on one side of the wall and you're on the other, and a concrete wall, and you turn your laptop on, and you connect to the Wi-Fi, it's going through the wall. Yeah. What do you think it's doing to your head? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 here's a little bit of more technical detail. If you're concussed, um, this is a study that was done several years ago. If you are concussed, your blood brain barrier is down. And by the way, RF does suppress uh, a blood brain barrier of the of the mind. But if you're concussed, we know that one dot six watts um, is the standard cell phone. And dot one watts, 15 times less, as I may have mentioned before, that's all it takes. It takes almost nothing to influence the cell. And mm. so I'm not worried about the thermal. I'm worried about the biological. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So let's let's talk real quick about what we can do about all of this, because it, it seems like I said before, with the precautionary principle, it just seems like that there's no sense in not taking some amount of measures against this and that you know in the book you pretty much lay out some pretty simple all the way up through some you know a little bit more complex things and so maybe just lay out you know what what do you what's kind of the low-hanging fruit what should we all be doing 
to just be the most cautious we can. And um, also, Dan, just to add on top of that, I, I want to, because we didn't get to this and maybe this would be relevant within your, within the context of your answer is, um, you know, the current virus and, and what we're currently facing and what, like any influence that you think this might have, obviously people are trying to draw a correlation between 5g and the virus. And it's really amazing to see people staunchly on both sides of it, who most of them, you know, don't have biology degrees, (laughs) aren't epidemiologists. Um, and so I'd love to hear your input about that. And then, you know, maybe that can tee into what we can do to really protect ourselves. Uh, to be very, 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 very clear, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever or correlation to any existing virus that we're dealing with in modern time today. None. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody who makes that claim doesn't understand biology or they don't understand physics. Um, (laughs) Or both. Yeah. (laughs) Or both. And you pointed out that's true. I've actually seen biochemists who don't understand physics. So um, so there there is no concern there. So we're going to focus on what it is you can do. And and it's it's actually simple. Um, uh, If you if you use technology. Um, and it's far away from you, you're pretty safe. If you use stuff really, really close and you use it a small duration of time, you're pretty pretty safe. It's when it's really close and you're using it a long time that becomes really not so good. And as I may have mentioned before, if you are a heavy user of cell phones um, and after about 10 years, you're three times more likely to get front, frontal lobe cancer. That's the research we know. But if you use it five or 10 minutes a day, you'll live to be an old woman and old man. You know, so simple time and distance. Um, Distance. Let's talk about that a little bit. When you have a cell phone to your head, um, all 1.6 watts per kilogram is penetrating into the frontal lobe. If you're one to two foot away, 80% of that danger from that cell phone is gone. Hmm. By 4%, 98, up to 98% is gone. It's a logarithmic drop of power levels. So all you got to do is put stuff away from you when you're not using it and you're fairly safe. And if you really want to be careful, turn the stuff off you don't need. Mm. Mm-hmm. And think of it, I use an analogy, which is perfect for you guys. Um, one bee won't kill you, a thousand will. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? And so. Yeah. And you, two bees might just save you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so think of those bees as transmitters in the room. If you have a cell phone and you have a, a Bluetooth transmitting from it, you have a Wi-Fi transmitting from it, and you have a cell tower transmitting from it, that's three bees. Mm-hmm. Turn two of them off, and you have one bee, put it far enough away, four foot or more, and you're pretty safe. So the whole idea is to control your environment by minimizing the number of bees in the room. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't need the bee on, turn it off. Good example is um, your Wi-Fi. Um, if you choose to have a Wi-Fi, which so many of us do, um, put it a far enough. You put it in the back room where no one goes. It goes 500 feet. So mm-hmm. it's, you're going to get the service you want, but the power levels are really low at that point. And so put it back in. And if it's even remotely close to your bedroom, make sure it's turned off. Get a little $10 timer, turn it on at seven o'clock in the morning when you're up. Um, it Turn it off at 11 o'clock when you go to bed. And you make sure you don't have transmitters into your environment while you're sleeping. And Mm -hmm. absolutely get everything out of your bedroom. Mm -hmm. And that is really one of the most fundamentally important because of the the recovery time interval you need, your your rhythm, body rhythms, all of those things are so important. And they are clearly interfered with. So if you are think you're so important where well, you have to have the cell phone a foot away from your uh, head, you're not that important because you're not right. going to last very long. Uh, you you, you want to take it out of the room. It's You want to take your 
uh, tablets out of the room that have Wi-Fi, or turn the Wi-Fi off. And you want to take your clocks and move them away, at least four foot away, even the analog clocks. And so you're minimizing the emissions in the, the ambient emissions in, the, in that environment. That's where it's so important to focus on. Um, the next, um, I, I, I personally don't use Wi-Fi. I have Ethernet in, uh, connected throughout my whole house. When I use a laptop, I have an Ethernet connection to the laptop. And I don't have it in my lap. I have it on my table. And I have a, 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 a monitor. I, I eliminate any close sources to my body as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those general principles are important. And as last resort, if you're really going to use it a long time and you refuse um, to, um, to do it short duration, use shielding. Um, yeah. I literally invented shielding for my sons mm. because my wife said it was dangerous. And I said it wasn't. And I lost. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, by the way, Vanessa, I still don't have grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that's not a shielding problem. Just, yeah, that's not a shielding <laughs> problem. That I know. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about the shielding that you, that you offer, that you create? Because I know there's some for your phone, there's some for your laptop. Just talk a little bit about the products. Actually, um, we use, I, I design shielding that actually shields a bunch of stuff. Um, we, we talked almost exclusively today about the RF, the radio frequency, the microwave stuff. Um, we have not talked about household wiring. Mm-hmm. Um, household wiring is 300 hertz and below, mostly 60 hertz because your service to your house is an alternating current 60 hertz. That emits anytime there's current flow in the house the wall emanates electromagnetic radiation at 60 hertz. So we build shielding into our devices that doesn't allow the device itself to transmit that through uh, to your body. And so we shield extremely low frequency emissions as well as RF emissions. And um, we use a lot of different technologies to do that. Um, But we do the complete. And in fact, believe it or not, with 5G, we actually, believe it or not, are making available 90 gigahertz shielding. Uh, we've been working wow. for over a year to develop with our uh, uh, laboratories the, the ability to shield uh, these 90 gigahertz. So when you're using uh, your services in a small cell site, uh, you actually have devices to shield yourself with. Mm. Hmm. You know, and it just seems like this is going to actually be the best way forward, right? Because I, I mean, I don't see the telecommunications are going to go, you know, we'll wait 10 years and see, we'll do some more studies. Like, I mean, this thing is already happening. Like, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Yeah, This is your like not smoking. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So it's (laughs) like. It's it's kind of like all right. Well, maybe there'll be better technology in the future, but as of now, like the best thing we can do right. is protect ourselves. Exactly. I'm not a victim. You know, you right. take yeah. action. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I I applaud those who really are taking action with the federal government and others. I had a friend of mine bump into uh, Kennedy um, um, fairly recently, and he was talking about this stuff to him because obviously I'm pretty passionate about it. And um, he brought a suit against the FCC for the standard. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I see more and more people doing that. And that's really, really good because it's in court that they will lose. Right. Um, and I hope that will happen soon. But in the meantime, a lot of people are going to be affected if we don't take action. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I have uh, on the shielding thing I had uh, or we had we had a guest on who actually makes Mm -hmm. near infrared saunas. So they're, you know, it's an incandescent bulb that, you know, fires off the the red light therapy kind of thing. And he had noticed and he we talked about it on the podcast that when one of his or any near infrared bulb comes close to a electronic device, it reduces the amount of EMF that he was able to pick up with whatever his little EMF Geiger counter was. 
is that something? And he's like, I have no idea how this works. I just happened to notice it one day when I had my red light on near my computer. Is that, do you have any idea how that would be working or is this just some sort of anomaly in the, I, it's an anomaly to me, but, but, but infrared, the creation of uh, the energy to drive the infrared does generate electromagnetic radiation, the ELF stuff. Right. And so right. if you are looking for an infrared um, device, you really do want to make sure you find those that me- that have the least emissions. And these manufacturers are aware of it. So they, mm. they, they, if they have the, if they can make the claim, they will, but yeah. yeah. But as far as it interfering with the infrared interfering with, I'm I'm not sure I understand it, so I I don't think yeah. I'd be able to respond to it. Yeah, that was kind of my take. And I, and I, we watched him do it. He had his little thing up, you know, and he's like, you know, he holds an Exus computer, and then he put brings the light into the thing we we're on video, and it stops doing it. He's like, I don't know, well, <laughs> neither <laughs> do we, and neither do you. So perfect. All right, perfect. we'll leave, we'll chalk that one up to his uh, unsolved mystery. Awesome. Well, this has been really illuminating, and um, I love this. We've been, you know, this is obviously so many people are trying to wrap their heads around yep. this topic, and you know, it seems like people are staunchly in one camp or the other. And I really love that you you're kind of bridging the two camps and at the end pulling us to a place of like, okay, you're right, we're not victims. Let's take the necessary steps. Which, to be honest, is just a lot about habit change. It's yeah. just yeah. like instead of falling asleep with your you know phone next to your bed every night, put it in the living room or put right. it or or turn it off. I'm assuming that would be probably a, a solution as well. Of course, right, <laughs> and, exactly. And and so it's like a lot of this are just small changes that we can make, and that seems like we could at least if nothing else, give ourselves that recovery period each night free from exposure to this stuff, which hopefully will just fortify us against whatever we are dealing with during the daytime hours. Uh, Absolutely. If if you're not eating right, if you're not properly hydrated, if you don't have a good balance, mineral balance, if, if those things are out of kilter, it just gets worse when you have these mm-hmm. exposures. Mm-hmm. Um, and to the other point you were making, you don't have to put a cell phone in the back of a stroller with your kid and roll them around. Mm-hmm. All you got to do is mm-hmm. not put it in your back pocket, put it in your wallet, pocketbook or something, but reduce the exposures. And that's an action you can take that's simple. Don't use Wi-Fi to make sure the child's sleeping at night. Go into the bedroom. You don't need that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's so many little things. I always say you need nothing I sell mm. if you watch your environment. You can really make it safe if you think through what that environment is. And we're not victims, as I said. You own the problem. No one else is going to fix it. Awesome. Awesome. So tell folks where they can find the book, where they can find the products, all that good stuff. Okay. So um, DefendeShield.com or Amazon is where you can find the book and our our website, DefendeShield.com. In the website, I have whole learning sections. I have like 10, 15 pages that describes 5G. Uh, I, I I describe all the research detail that correl- can be correlated to the studies. So if anyone wants to take a more deep dive, go learn some more. It, mm-hmm. It's readily available. And if you see so fit, um, we have a variety of products driven by basically our customer base, um, which is goes from um, ear earphones uh, using acoustical linking uh, to uh, – to um, uh, cell phone protection, uh, laptop protection, we, we we try to provide and and blankets. That was one thing that we actually wanted to make a blanket for pregnant women. That's literally what we we started out with, but we're finding that electric hypersensitive love the neutrality of it, the feeling mm-hmm. that they the coolness they feel because of the ambience that's now being protected from our blankets. Mm. So more and more mm. people are finding that as a relief for themselves. Interesting. Yeah. I love that idea. To your own little Faraday blanket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's actually accurate. 
It's a mm. floating ground. That's what it actually is. Mm. It, it really is source to ground, but it floats. It doesn't have to be in the ground. Right. Mm. That's what it That's actually beautiful. is. I love that. And you know, the one thing I just want to kind of close this with as well is that I think it's really important, and maybe you could speak to, to this as well, is that our state of mind and how we feel about this stuff is so important. And instead of being afraid, instead of, you know, having that fear response, like the, the thing that I have found is so important for me is just to make the intention that like, I am safe. I am protected. My body is fine, no matter what comes at it. And even if all of this stuff is in, you know, the air and the ambience around us, that like we have an intentionality and a domain over our own physical well being, just from the way we think about it. And just from the way we feel about it. And I don't know if you have any parting words that, that uh, or feelings about that as well, but I just, you know, I, I have the sense of folks being like, Oh no, all these things I have to protect myself. But I think one of the most important things you can do is just the positive mindset that your body is healthy and that you're living in a vital being and that you can, you are the master of that domain. Vanessa, I so much agree with what you said. You and I are not going to take a rocket to the moon to avoid this stuff. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay on earth because we like using our cell phones. <laughs> All you got to do is be diligent about the use of the devices around you. Very simple exercises can really improve the probability of your health and the causal effects, uh, which are negative to your body. And this is not a discussion we're having today about being frightened. This is all about taking control of the environment you own and take the actions you can take and they're simple and not too inconvenient and why not yeah until we learn a little bit more awesome Perfect. awesome thank you thank you so much for being with us thanks for the work you do and thanks for breaking that down for us so that i think we can all just kind of wrap our heads around that a little bit more and and feel really empowered to to just feel safe around this, this subject as it gets, you know, further discovered how the impact is going to be for all of us. Right. I, I want to thank both of you for inviting me on today. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity because I think it's so important to try to give a balanced view of what these environments are that we live in today. And we shouldn't panic and we should get control. And if you do, it does make a difference. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan. This has been great. Okay, Adam and uh, Vanessa, thanks so much. That's all she wrote. That was a nutrient-dense podcast. <laughs> and I'm sure that you guys got um, some some good takeaways from that, I hope, because there it was just chock full of them, you know, and especially when it comes to just what you can do right now to hedge your bets against EMF, like even if you're not really that worried about it. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. You might have a little dog that it makes a big difference for. You might. <laughs> <laughs> or you might have, uh, I don't want to say a little brain. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, you might have a little brain. I don't mean little, little in the way that it's, you know, small. But, <laughs> you know, your brain as a whole is kind of small. <laughs> a brain that Compared might Compared to your better. thorax. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so give it a shot. And we are so looking forward to having you guys back with us next week. If you have yet to subscribe to the Be The Wellness podcast, now is your moment to subscribe and, you know, leave us that five-star review. Yeah. Scroll down in your feed. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, there's a way to leave a review. And if you do that, we would so greatly appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, because it makes a difference. It and does. I think you guys can tell. Yes. Because what, since we've been you know, pushing this more and more, the reviews have been coming in and we have been able to get you know, some pretty awesome guests. Some pretty awesome guests. And, and some more like are coming. Yeah. yeah. So it really does make a difference. And we are so privileged and honored to be able to bring these conversations to you. And there's so many more people we want to talk to. So, <laughs> all right, guys, we'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye. Bye.